Patrick was on the drums and looking at me and Joe was looking at me and Patrick and Joe's like, you okay, Tony? And I was like, <laughs> I'm just really nervous, man. And then Patrick started laughing. And then Joe goes, oh man, this, this is just like any other gig. I was like, I haven't played any other gigs. <laughs> and then he was like, oh, okay. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. The Lone Star Play Podcast is produced by TexasRealFood.com. Find out more at the end of this episode. Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. All right, we have an awesome episode today. As always, my guest is Tony Camel. He's a uh, singer, songwriter, artist, musician, podcaster now. A lot of cool stuff going on with this guy. He is um, lead singer of a Grammy-nominated uh, bluegrass band called Wood and Wire, and he came out with his very first solo album. It's called Back Down Home, and um, so check out all the links in the you know the description to get the album and check it out and to check out Tony. Um, and his podcast is also called Back Down Home. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, he's a new dad. He's got all this new music. Um, it was really, really cool conversation. Really enjoyed it. Um, so, you know, sit back and enjoy this wonderful podcast, right? And we got a little food trivia there at the end that we're doing with everybody. So uh, before we get to the interview, let's have a quick uh, word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food, because... We got to keep the mics on and then we'll be right back. Hi, I wanted to talk to you about other things that are on the Texas Real Food site that are just as amazing as putting in your zip code, finding the best place around you that's serving, you know, all natural, fresh, organic ingredients. All right. There's resources on there. Reviews blogs, articles, and most importantly, Texas Real Food recipes. So you can find things on there that really aren't on any other site. I promise you that. And stuff that's pretty standard, but we give it a twist, right? That's the chef way. Something familiar with a twist. So we've got, for instance, cinnamon spiced hot cross buns. You can also find a great Texas strawberry cheesecake recipe. Just amazing stuff. So please check it out at texasrealfood.com. All right, back to the show. All right, and we're back. Okay, before we get to this interview real quick, I'm going to bring up, as always, our social media. Please follow us online, Lone Star Plate TX on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we would appreciate it. And if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. That would help us out a lot. Hit the like, leave us a comment, whatever you want. Uh, tell us what you thought of the episode. Tell us what you thought of Tony's music. There you go. Um, all right, let's get to this uh, interview. Tony Campbell, again, the album is Back Down Home. Check out the links in the description for the album. And um, let's get to this. Let's just start the conversation. All right, Tony Campbell, enjoy. Look, let's just... Um, I'm just happy to have you on, man, and we we get a chance to chat. And I appreciate you giving me a little extra thirty minutes. Actually, I had another interview. No problem. Uh, oh, this good. morning as well. So um, this has been a jam packed week for me, um, which has been great. Um, yeah, we got a new season. We got you coming on, man. We've never had you on. We're really excited to talk to you, man. You got this cool new uh, you know project coming out. Um, it sounded very intriguing to me good. personally, good, especially glad. someone someone who I, I like your story. Um, a little bit because well a lot actually um because i, I can relate to it in some ways but mm -hmm. I, I love this idea that you've taken risks you've stepped out of your comfort zone in in many ways in different ways um as well and I, I respect that about people who are willing to take that chance and go for it and want something more and very ambitious and yeah i thought we'd just dive a little bit of uh, deeper into that a little bit so um you basically have this new album that, that's your cool. your album right your 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 very mm -hmm. first album back down home yes um and you were in well you were you still are right in wooden wire you're still in that group 
still part yeah, of the them? group hasn't broken up uh yeah. technically we're we're just not playing right now between pandemic babies day jobs and some some band stuff we got to work out uh, it made sense to for me to do this record now and uh, and that's yeah. what i'm focused on for the time being yeah that's awesome and, and that's what i mean like sure. that's so cool you know you're part of wooden wire you got this thing you know you know what I, I need something more. I want something more. I, I, I need to do this. And maybe other people telling you, hey, dude, you got a great, you know, you should do this. You should try this. Or a lot of times what happens, I think, in bands is you you have a particular style of songs for that particular band. And then sure. you start writing other stuff that's outside of that. And you're like, how do I get this out? Right. Because it right. can't go through this. L let me do this project over here. And uh, yeah, let's just dive into this. Um, let's do into it. this album and, and, and why and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. man. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, talk about this. Cool. Yeah. I mean, floor. sure. So I think, um, for me, this album consists of songs I wrote years ago, um, that a few of them that we tried in wood and wire that just didn't fit or we did, we couldn't get the right kind of recording, um, songs that I wrote, um, you know, recently as well. And, and, uh, so it sort of sp it runs the gamut of, of, I guess the oldest song on this record, as far as when I wrote it, is probably around six or seven years old. And then the newest couple of songs I wrote uh, this in August of 2020. And frankly, those are the last songs I've written. I haven't written a song in over a year. And that's normal for me. I'm not worried about it or anything. I just I write whenever oh, wow. I feel like writing. I'm not yeah. I don't write songs every day like some people. And um, so I guess I, I met Bruce Robison a little over four, maybe five years ago, went into the stu his studio, The Bunker, where we did this to play banjo and sing on a song by this really great songwriter named Christy Hayes. And um, me and Dom Dominic Fisher, the bass player for Wooden Wire, went in to work with her on that. And that's when I met Bruce. And um, so then Wooden Wire did some work with Bruce over those years. I got to know him and um, he liked my songs, you know, and, and he heard that they weren't, even when we recorded them in, in Wood and Wire, Wood and Wire being a bluegrass band, quote unquote, we didn't write bluegrass songs. We wrote songs and then we played them with our instrumentation that is bluegrass instrumentation. So it came out that way. So he heard that. He heard that we were, that my songs and, and the other songs in the band were just songs, you know, and, and songs that he liked. And uh, as we got to know each other, he um, saw that, you know, he he started saying, "Well, you should you should explore the stuff you used to do as well." Because I kind of fell into bluegrass a little, almost like an accident. <laughs> you know, uh, we formed a band that got popular. We formed a bluegrass band that had original songs and got popular around where we lived. And we rode that wave, and and uh, and it grew, and it was great. It was a blast, and it's still it's 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 the ride we went on was a ride that. <laughs> I never thought I'd really get to go on, you know, and it all happened sort of naturally. Anyway, um, you know, Bruce heard influences. And as we got to know each other, we talked more about the kind of music I liked and he liked. And, and he just encouraged me to explore other areas. Uh, and he asked me to go in and record songs probably four more than four years ago. And I couldn't do it because we were busy with the band, you know. And uh, so the, the discussions of this record happened years ago. And then I think the circumstances uh, of 2020 and, and certain things around the band made it appropriate for me to do it, uh, to record it finally this past February 2021 or February, early March, late February, early March. I mean, we, we only tracked, but, the, but from the first day of recording to it being completely mastered was exactly one month. So oh wow, uh, it was um, a really quick process. And the recording yes, process was about three, three and a half days of of uh, tracking really three full days of tracking. And then, uh, and, and then we spent about eight days mixing it too. So, uh, it, it was really fun, man. I, I think that's sort of the history anyway. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, there's more to it. We worked really hard on gathering the songs and, and making sure that, um, they were, sorry, my dog's bothering me over here. They were, uh, <laughs> you know, appropriate. And, and we, a lot of it was process of elimination, you know, whittling down the songs we wanted to focus on. No, that's awesome. How, how many songs didn't make it on the album? Only one song that we actually recorded didn't make it on the record. Um, I it. brought, you know, six, seven songs, 
six or seven more songs or some of them complete, some of them not complete to Bruce that he, could he wasn't from, super sort of. into. Yeah. He, I mean that he wasn't super into that. We, yeah. The initial meetings where we were going over songs, I brought some songs. He was like, oh, I'm not super into these, but I really like these. And then we worked harder on that. And then I realized I need more songs. So fortunately I was in a place of creativity where I was feeling like I should write and felt yeah. like writing. So I wrote a couple of more songs and then, uh, and, and then I went through my old notes, voice memos, uh, journals and whatnot, and found a couple of incomplete songs that I could work on and, and found a song that I had been playing for years, but just sort of didn't really realize how it was, it fit within this Gulf coast theme that started to emerge. Yeah. And as that, as we were whittling down songs and the Gulf Coast theme started to emerge, uh, I rewrote and edited what the songs we were going to record to try to bring that theme out a little bit more uh, where it's appropriate. I didn't want to force it where it didn't work. And then, uh, and we ended up recording 11 songs and keeping 10. And that, that 11th song, I was the only person on the entire team, musicians, audio engineers, Bruce, and, uh, you know, record the, the people he has working with him that, that, that didn't want that song on the record. But it's a great recording and it's a cool song. I just think it didn't fit and, and maybe it can be used later. Oh, so you, everyone else wanted it, but you said yeah. no. Oh, yeah. wow. That is yeah. great. That is kind of crazy. Uh, to, well, it's a, te pull it's, that a test it's a testament to Bruce Robison and the next waltz and the team. They're, they're very artist forward and artist first. So, yeah, you know, he, he produced this record. I mean, Technically, we produced it together, but he's he's the producer. But he gave me the final say on a decision like that, and a lot oh, yeah, of people wouldn't do it. that. Yeah, I can respect that, man. Like I, you know, I used to make. Uh, I used to work as a chef for a long time, so you make mm -hmm. menus, and the hardest thing to do is to cut something off your menu. You don't, you know, that doesn't belong there or whatever. You know, you, it could be something you've had on for a while, and you just like right. nope, don't want to. But a good chef knows what to cut. What you know, what 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 to. I mean, it's just that simple. You've got to let it go, not not have any sort of emotion tied to it. Uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, man. Day. Eliminating things down to the best stuff is one of the hardest things to do, but it's also a luxury. If you're if you're yeah. making those difficult decisions, then you're doing something right because you're you're just whittling it down to the best stuff. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's a luxury. It is a luxury. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I had an artist on one time who I asked that to, and she was like, uh, hello, I, I, every song we recorded, I put out. She's like, I don't have that kind of money. We don't, we are as a band. We didn't have that kind of money. Just record all these tracks and then decide which ones we were going to put on the album. I mean, that's how she explained yeah. it to us. I was like, well, that makes sense. I never really thought about that. That makes sense. So you got to like, you got to cut the, you got to cut the fat before you even get in the studio. You've yeah. got to make those, you know, decisions ahead of time. Um, but I also realize how much a song changes once you get it in the studio and you start mm -hmm. laying down tracks and all of a sudden things start changing a little bit and someone sure. comes up with some something new or what, you know, could totally take the song a, a different way. So anyway. Um, yeah, man. That, what would you say? Um, I, I think you said Gulf Coast. Is that what you said? Yeah. Gulf Coast theme. What, what does yeah. that mean exactly? What, what do you well, mean by that? Well, there's... Um literally some songs directly about the Gulf coast on the record. Um, there's some songs, uh, that just sort of mention Gulf coast vibes. Okay. And, uh, it, it's, it's more of a backdrop. Um, the theme of the songs on like the record, a, a lot of it is, is, is sort of change and, uh, times are changing and stuff like that. So you could certainly, I guess you could relate that to, to 2020, but a lot of these songs were written before that. I, I went through a yeah. lot of changes. My dad passed away. Oh, I'm sorry uh, to hear mayor. that. It's okay, man. Everybody's going to die, you know? And uh, was my, my dad we passed went away uh, five years ago as well. Yeah. It was about six for me too. Yeah. So uh, it totally rocked our worlds. And um, yeah. ever since then, it just feels like it, it, everything, it sort of opened a floodgate to, of, everything else changing behind it or yeah. and so you know that can get really uncomfortable and when things sort of feel like they're falling down around you um you look i look to places of comfort and stability for me that's uh, uh you know kind of where i grew up i grew up in houston i spent a lot of time in galveston texas 
uh, on the beach with my family, friends, and I still do just not as much. And uh, I love going down there. I still do. And yeah. when those types of uh, situations are brewing, I look to that place and go to that place and I feel the feels and smell the smells and I feel better, you know? And, and so that's kind of why it's a backdrop of positivity, I hope, amongst uh, changing times. So the record, I want to be a positive uh, thing, you know, despite all the, the mess around me, I want it to be this, this positive spin. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, I, I kind of, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of like this whole Gulf coast thing. Um, you, you always hear about West coast, East coast, right. like we need our own. I like this Gulf coast uh, thing a lot. Like it, the songs don't even need to be, even be about the Gulf coast. Sure. Just you're from that area. You, I like this. I don't know this. I don't know if it's existed before and I'm an idiot and I'm just now hearing about it. Or if this is something new, you sort of or jumping onto, I don't know. I like it. I, I'm not, I'm just going to say, I like it. <laughs> I certainly won't claim it to be new, but I think it's unique for right now. Um, I don't think there are many people. Uh, there's some We're guys that, that write about it. Yeah. There's some guys. I never heard it. it. Well, Hayes Carl, he's, he's, he's a, he's a Houston guy as well. Yeah. Um, there's some of that within his music. Um, maybe not as much as mine on this record. I mean, I kind of, I, I, some might say I write about it too much, but uh, anyways, but, but, uh, you know, there's, um, and I'm not just talking about the Texas coast. I mean, the Gulf coast thing, if you go to Louisiana and Mississippi, I mean, it's Absolutely. there too. It's, it's yeah, yeah. heavier there than it is in Texas actually. But yeah. I think that the Texas coast is a really unique place. And I hope that, um, this record is unique in that way and other ways to the sound, the vibe, uh, the, the type of songs. I don't know. I, I don't try to do anything on purpose, but I, I do try to not do things. You know, I don't want to sound like everybody else or anything sure. else that's out there. I feel you. Um, what, what's your favorite song on the, or which song are you most proud of uh, on this record? Man, that's a good question. Um, I think that my favorite song on the record is called the surfer. Okay. I don't think it'll be the most popular song. Um, not that millions of people are going to listen to this, but you know, I, I think amongst my small group of fans, um, I'm not sure that'll be the most popular song, but um, the story behind that song is I was down in Surfside, Texas, which is just outside of Freeport. Um, and it's a place people go to surf. I mean, it, there's occasionally you get some good waves there and it's fun and there's a cool little community around it. For years, I'd seen this guy out there um, who was much older than me, but appeared to be in good shape for his age and um, had a big bushy mustache. And I never talked to him, but I was there in August of 2020 and I was about to go out there, about to paddle out. And I saw him sitting in his truck and he kind of looked at me and I had never talked to him. And I just started chatting with him. And he was telling me how he couldn't surf anymore because he had a hip replacement and had to have a few surgeries around that. And his hands were messed up from laying tile for 40 or 50 years. And he told me his uh, uh, life story about going down to Port Isabel, and, which is uh, it's basically South Padre Island. It's a little town on the other side of the bay from South Padre. And uh, camping out in a trailer park and going surfing there to chase hurricane swells which is uh, in the gulf coast the best waves come when there's a hurricane in the gulf uh, that's going to hit usually if it's going to hit louisiana or mississippi we'll get some uh, something in, in texas um anyway after he told me that story his life story i wrote that song about him and that was probably the quickest song that came and uh, i just like story songs about other people that that seem interesting and um trying to track him down because I want to show it to him and I want to oh, wow. talk to him and have a conversation with him for a podcast I'm working on uh, yeah. that goes with the record as well. So that's probably my favorite one. The other reason, and I'm blathering on about it, it's one of my favorite ones is because we no, wanted no, to give I it- I love a, hearing this stuff, man. Uh, really? We wanted to give it this Cajun feel. So we put accordion on it and it's real uh, in a classy way. And one of the overdubs we did was a triangle which is something that's prominent in different types of Cajun music. 
uh, and the percussionist on the record, the drummer, and he played all the different percussion. Um, he, his name is Josh Blue. He went in there with a triangle and played along uh, and nailed it on the first take. And then when we were mixing, the engineer that was mixing the record, he, and I want to note this studio is all analog. There's no computers or anything. Everything in there is old school wow. and everything's live, done live. So uh, it, it's an old school way of recording. And, and I think you can really hear that if you listen closely. So when he was mixing the, the triangle and mixing the song, I'll see if I can explain this to anyone who doesn't know much about recording, but there's something called reverb that uh, you, you hear, you, you'd recognize it. You'll hear it if you sing in a church or a shower. It's that echoey sound that makes people's voices sound good. The old school way of getting reverb is this, you'd get a big reverb chamber where you put a speaker on one end of it on the other two sides and, and you play the speaker through this chamber that has metal plates. And on the other side of the chamber is a microphone and it captures this echoey sound. And you adjust the chamber to be tighter so the plates are tighter or looser so the reverb sounds bigger or smaller. So he put the triangle through the reverb chamber on one channel when we were mixing. And then he had it dry with no reverb on the other. And then on every third or, or every fourth beat, he'd slam up the fader that had the reverb to make it this big, loud chime bell sound. And it really added a lot. So if you listen to that song and you'll hear it, uh, you'll hear this sort of bell happening every now and then. And, and that's just this sort of genius idea that Jim Valentine, the guy who mixed it had. Uh, and that's wow. one of the reasons it's one of my favorites because it, it, the recording process for it was really fun. And the mixing process was, process was even more fun once we found that little thing to sort of yeah. put it over the top. That's awesome, man. Wow, what a great story. I love hearing those things. Um, you, you never think a triangle is going to be like the, the, the game changer. I know. Right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I'm so proud of this yeah. record. It's it, it's like the things that happened on it that are so special, they're not things that I necessarily did. You know, I mean, I, I we worked together to come totally. up with these cool ideas yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that I just put we, Bruce put me surrounded me and are surrounded us with these brilliant people to make it all be what it, what it ended up being. That's awesome. No, that's, that's so amazing. Um, you, you mentioned the podcast a little bit. I definitely mm -hmm. wanted to bring it up. So I'm glad you brought it up and make a nice, easy transition here. Let, let's dig into that a little bit more. Cause I, I'll be honest. I, I, this might be the first time I've heard of this, of an album and a supporting podcast mm -hmm. for that album it totally makes sense though the way you've have done that like it, that makes absolute sense so let's dive into this more of like what it is exactly and why sure. you know why you want to do it and i'm sure you know where to go from there the podcast is called the name of the record is back down home the podcast is called back down home beyond the liner notes it's on uh, spotify apple podcast google stitcher and stuff um i've got a trailer in the first episode out basically what i want to cover is some of the stuff like we just talked about the making of the record, uh, coming up with the songs, some of the recording processes, the way that we used analog, some of the interesting stuff around that. But I want to do it via other people, the people that I worked with, just like I was saying yeah. before, all these great people that came together. So that's sort of a finite thing. And you can only talk so much about how something's made. But yeah, limited get, series. Uh, yeah, potentially. You know, I, yeah. I love it. I, I mean, but, I, that's awesome. But one of the things I want to get into, and the first episode does this, is the deeper facets of the record. Why am I so interested in the Gulf Coast? It's because the people are weird and cool, <laughs> you know? Like I, like, I think I'm a pretty weird guy. But the people down in Galveston, there's just a lot of unique people. So the way I'll explain the Gulf Coast theme and use it for the podcast is by uh, doing it through people I know in Galveston and other parts of the Gulf Coast or people that grew up there that are interesting. So the first episode is is with this guy named Rex Bell. Rex played bass with Towns Van Zant and was his best wow. friend, was a, a close friend of his for many years. He also played bass with blues legend Lightning Hopkins. He lived, lived with the guys from ZZ Top before they were ZZ Top. He wow. he most notably founded the Old Quarter, uh, a venue in Houston uh, that was just amazing place for musicians and hippies and stuff in the 60s. It closed in the mid 70s, reopened in the mid 90s in Galveston. He reopened it in Galveston in the mid 90s. It's open still today. 
Um, so I talked to Rex because he's a Galveston resident. He's a Gulf Coast guy. He's a Texan and he has an, an a amazing story and he's a unique yeah. guy. And the stories he tells on that first episode are amazing. He goes into yeah. everything, everything from heroin deals gone bad to almost getting shot to playing bass Woo! with lightning Hopkins. I mean, it's, it's Woo! pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be, it's, it's wow. gonna be a hard one to top, frankly, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, ne the right. next episode, the next episode, is I'm going to release next week is with um, uh, the the people who bought the old quarter from Rex and kept it the way it is. And they're, they're Galveston uh, Gulf Coast residents as well. And so uh, we talk about why they wanted to keep it the way it is and keep the memorabilia and not change anything. So that, that's kind, kind of, of the uh, way I want to do it. No, I love it, man. I, again, this is such a, you got a lot of unique ideas, brother. I got to tell you, this is, Thanks, uh, man. you're, you're, you're on to something. Okay. Uh, like this. Um, <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast thing is for sure, dude, that's, let's be real. I, I look, I do podcasting. This, this is my right. thing. Like there's no, not that I've always done it, uh, but, uh, for the past couple of years that that's, I'm going to, I'm officially a podcaster. I can say that. So, uh, good job, dude. Well, you know? Yeah. Thank you, man. It's, it's been a great uh, change, um, getting out of the kitchen, but, <laughs> Well, you know, that that idea of having this supporting podcast, I mean, that just doesn't um, it's just not out there. That, that just doesn't exist. And I like that. I, I could see that being a new way to release an album, to have this supporting podcast because music's changing. Right. Let's be real. And all the artists I talk to, they're all talking about how it's changed. Even with the pandemic is changing again. Yeah. And how how music gets out, how you record it, how you make your money, you know, how you promote yourself. And, and this is such a great great idea dude i could even i'm sure there are podcasts out there that sort of delve in you know behind an album and find out mm -hmm. what what the thing is but i could see even taking this a little bit further like you helping other artists do it like you help them host their podcast for their album that they're gonna you know do and and whatever but anyway whatever i, I love yeah, it I, uh, I like doing it it's a lot of work i've noticed you guys work hard it's it's takes not easy quite a bit because i'm doing everything yeah. the producing the editing everything and it's oh wow it's definitely yeah. not easy but but i've enjoyed it i think it's just like we recorded the record as old school as you can possibly record something but trying to promote it and do unique new school things we have a yeah. video we have videos for every we had video in the studio the whole time we have videos for every take of the song on the record so you we we're going to release them periodically but you can watch eventually you'll be able to watch if you like the way that this song was recorded, you can watch us recording it in, in, in awesome. the takes that. So uh, it was, it was quite fun. No, I think that's great, man. I think anything you can add to, you know, for your fan to pick up on from your mm -hmm. album, right? Like any extra little thing that, that makes people, it makes you stand out more in a sea of artists. That's there's a million people out there trying to right get that. What, what I've heard other mus musicians say is, um, the good news is there's a lot more artists out there and a lot more music. The bad news is there's a lot yeah. more music and a lot more artists out there. Right. Like, so it's a yeah. double edged sort of, of trying to stand out and make yourself, you know, known and, and you want people to, you know, uh, take in all the hard work, um, you know, you've done. And I think adding these extra elements, these other little things is what brings people yeah. in, man, to be honest. It's so, it's so true, especially lately. There's so many good records coming out by independent artists and, yeah. um, it's hard to to break through the noise, but yeah. you know I think the trick is just to make your own shit. And uh, <laughs> yeah. excuse my language. Sorry if I can't. I know. Uh, I uh, you can't. I'll say okay. shit. Uh, you can't. Okay, you cool. can't but the trick is just make your own shit, and then that don't wait around. I, I'm not. I can't wait around to yeah. to like end up on some big special playlist on Spotify or anything. I did. I mean, we were lucky we did get on some good playlists, but it's like, you know, you, you can't control that stuff, but you can make your own stuff and, and maybe someone will latch on to it here and there. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I think that's great. Um, I, I actually heard, I guess we're going to kind of go back a little bit. That's kind of sure. the Lone Star Plate style. We're all over the place. Um, great. Let, let's, let's go back to like how you even, because I found, I th if I'm heard this right, like the story of how you got into music was just later in life, right? You didn't really get into it till much later. Am I right? Into into performing, yeah. Yeah, I, performing. I was. Um, I played music since I was 12 or so, but I 
didn't really step on a stage until I was uh, almost 30, I guess, like 28, 29. And, um, you know, I played for my friends here and there when I'd have too much to drink in high school and, and <laughs> definitely spent hours in my room learning stuff in, on the guitar. Uh, and then I started going to bluegrass jam when I wanted to learn how to play bluegrass because bluegrass is hard to play. You have to really study. And when I started studying it, I started going to bluegrass jams and I could always sing fine, but I couldn't really play solo bluegrass, the right kind of bluegrass solo. So I started getting into that. And then I met people who wanted to, you know, play with me and then wooden wire formed. And before that I met a guy named Graham Wilkinson who was like, dude, you're, you're good. You should play in my band. And so that was the first time I started playing regular gigs was with That's Graham awesome. and I was around 28, 29. And, um, and it was not long after that, that wooden wire formed. So, you know, I'm about 10 years in, I guess, of, of playing on stages and yeah, I and I that. like it that way because it still feels new. Yeah. A hundred percent. So how did, that must've felt great. Like having this guy say, Hey, you should be in my band, right? That's like every guy's dream that wants to be in a band, right? You just want to hear that. Yeah. Uh, that, that must've felt pretty cool. It was great. It's, it's really fun. Um, experience. I was so new. And I, I told this story the other day because the guy playing drums with Graham at the time, still playing drums with Graham, has been playing drums with me on these solo shows I've been doing with the band. And his name's Patrick Hertzfeld. He's a great drummer, great audio engineer. I, I already like the guy. Already. Yeah. Never. And he's uh, <laughs> the first time we played at Continental Club, which was the second gig I had done with Graham. It was packed. And I love Continental Club. I Great place. My favorite place ever. Great and, place. Um, I, uh, so nervous, you know, I was scared, scared shitless. And yeah, I, uh, there was a point where some of my friends were there to support and they kind of walked up near me on the stage and were like, or on the near where I was standing and kind of were like signaling to me to relax, you know, which didn't <laughs> help me relax at all. And then, um, and then there was a point not long after that, where the bass player, this guy, Joe Beckham kind of looked at me and he was like, kind of tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around and Patrick was on the drums and looking at me and Joe was looking at me and Patrick and Joe's like, you okay, Tony? And I was like, <laughs> I'm just really nervous, man. And then Patrick started laughing and then Joe goes, Oh man, this is, this is just like any other gig. I was like, I haven't played any other gigs. <laughs> and then, <laughs> he was like oh okay <laughs> i get it you know <laughs> so, oh shit that's hilarious <laughs> yeah and now uh, patrick's playing with me oh, at continental yeah. club next week for the the record release shows <laughs> and stuff so it's funny how things come back around oh dude i love that he's thinking he, he's he's nervous because it's a continental club he thinks it's a big club no 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 it's just it's his first gig yeah he just yeah. it's just nerd i love that dude what a great yeah. story um and look you get you got on there you crushed it and look where you're at now i wouldn't say i crushed it but i got through that gig and, and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm here now yeah <laughs> i love that well that's the only way to get through where you are right you've got to go through those you got to do your first gig somehow you can't skip it no way to oh, skip dude. the first gig, right? B bombing, bombing is so important. Um, I do a lot of shows by myself too, just me telling stories and and uh, playing the songs and and stuff. And those are my uh, some of my favorite ways to do it if I have a captive audience. Yeah, and, and, and getting good at that is requires bombing, just bombing really bad many times. Um, you know, it's not as bad as if you're a stand-up comedian and bombing. You know, that's a sure. that's much worse. But because, but but, you know, making jokes and people not laughing or telling stories that people turns out isn't interesting to anyone but you. You have to learn that stuff. And <laughs> figure out which ones are gonna resonate. Yeah, um, so. no, that's hilarious. Um, yeah. Look, Aaron Franklin famously said, uh, even on our podcast, he he had to mm -hmm. cook a. A thou he had to burn a thousand briskets before he started making good ones. Okay. So oh, yeah. you, yeah. you got to go through and Anthony Bourdain famously used to say, you've got to go through the bad meals to get to the good ones. And I, I feel that I feel that works in music and the, right. Like the same, same sort of thing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, man. It, it's part of the deal. You got to feel that pain. You really yeah. do. 
yeah, it helps you enjoy the other side of it, you know, appreciate it uh, as well. So, mm -hmm. no, that's awesome. Uh, and uh, so the podcast is out, you said on all platforms. Yeah. Um, for one episode's out now, you got another one coming out. Is it on audio and video or just audio? Just audio. I, I yeah. have some video that I'll release, but and I have a Patreon that I just started. I have one patron, so I'll have uh, extra <laughs> extra little tidbits from the podcast um, and, and and some live recordings and stuff and whatever people want, I'll put on there. So uh, right you got a bunch of new stuff I'm trying to build up. No, I love that, man. I love it, and, and we'll have links in our description and all cool. that. And I do it. I do a separate intro. I'll bring it up. Well, you know, don't even sweat all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about your new father. Yeah, man. Uh, Holy cow. I know. And, uh, it's great. I like it. Yeah. Um, she's a super good baby and sleeps pretty well and, and eats well. And we're very fortunate there. Daddy daycare just started. Um, my wife, uh, God bless her. She just went back to work two days ago. Uh, so wow. every day is, now I just take her with me everywhere. Um, I got meeting with Bruce on Monday. I'm taking her with me. I got a vocal rehearsal with someone on Wednesday. I'm taking her with me, you know? So uh, it, it's, it's really been a joy. And I think right now she's in, she's four months, two, four and a half months. And I've heard that between now and like eight months is a really, really fun time. And in and, and one of the easier phases. So I'm relishing in it right now and enjoying it very much. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. I personally don't have any kids. Um, I don't really like kids. Mm -hmm. honest, I'm not really a kid person. I'm 41. Mm -hmm. Never had kids. I, maybe it'll happen. I don't. I love my nephews. Yeah. I, lo I love seeing them. They're you know young boys. I love like I love to have like being around them for a couple hours and then I'm gone. Sure. I sure. <laughs> yeah. You know what, Patrick? That that's uh that's fair. And I felt that way for a long time, but yeah. um. But now I feel really, really good being a, a dad. Oh, I can't imagine. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving it, frankly. That's awesome. I really am. That's awesome. So. I'm jealous, man. I'm a little jealous of that feeling oh. that people have. Uh, like, would I? Would that happen to me if I had a child? Would I? Would I? Would I be there? Would I be that happy? I guess I would. Right. I guess would. I would be happy. Yeah. But I would. you know, yeah. I mean, there's part of me that's jealous of your freedom. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, that's I, always greener. Absolutely, man. Well, I've always said I don't want to have kids because I don't I'm too selfish. Like, I, I I don't know if I would give them the attention they deserve their child like they need, mm -hmm. you know, like they kind of need that attention. So anyway, yeah, man. they require they require quite a bit. We're still working. Bit, out right. Those, those yeah. Details. Yeah. <laughs> and we got two crazy dogs, too. If you, I'm sure you could hear them barking. Uh, I'm surprised you haven't heard mine barking. Mine are always <laughs> jumping up, getting in the way. They're always doing stuff. They're I took them for a long ass walk this morning, so I try to tire them out. Good, so uh, good. Right. So I did the same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, look, man, uh, Tony, we're going to do just as we head out of here, we're going to do a little bit of food trivia on our way out. Okay. I always do this with uh, with all of our guests. Well, recently we started doing that. Um, and it's been fun, actually. Um, see people's knowledge, how much they how, what, what kind of foodie are you? What, what kind of stuff do you are you pretty foodie? Do you on a scale of one to ten? What, how about how much of a foodie are you? Man, I, I probably put myself in the foodie world about a seven or eight. I'll eat some shitty That's food. That's pretty high. You know, yeah. I, but but I'm not afraid to eat some bad food either. Love that. Like Love like that. I, I have a really weird affinity for the, the Chinese buffet. I love Chinese buffets. And then um well, yeah. a lot of people a lot of people think that's disgusting. But um my my family, I come from I'm the grandson and great grandson of immigrants. So my dad's side is from Lebanon. My mom's side is from Italy, so oh, wow. uh, I love, love, love Middle Eastern food, particularly Lebanese food. That's my favorite food on earth Me too, is man. Middle Eastern wow. food. And uh, so my grandmother oh. would would make um, all kinds of authentic Lebanese food, tabbouleh, uh, meat pies, and something that she make that's super authentic Lebanese is kibbe, and it's this. It's kibbe, basically yeah. beef. It's basically beef tartare, and we'd eat it yeah. raw, and that's. If you're a real Lebanese, then you know what you know what's up with that, and uh, and then you know I, I love Italian food, but I think next to Lebanese food, different Asian foods are, is definitely my favorite. Uh, where where do you live right now? I live in Dripping Springs, Texas, just outside of Austin. Okay, you need to go to a place called Beirut in Austin. Okay, I've I haven't heard of that place. I'm writing it down. My friend well, Charlie, he's Lebanese. Awesome. Um, he 
He's been running that place. He ran that place when I had my food truck in Austin and I started mine in 2014. Really? Yeah. He's been running it for six, seven years now. It's honestly some of the best Lebanese food I've ever had in my life. Just a food trailer, but it's Charlie. He's from Lebanon. Like it's his, it's just so legit, dude. It's so legit. Oh. You're going to get a good shishta a good uh, shawarma, tabui made fresh, everything. The hummus, the, they'll make yeah. baba ganoush or mutabala, I think he calls it. Uh, and they'll even have some like labne sometimes Sweet. Uh, for, for like special occasion. But they're just do always doing something. They make I'm, fresh baklava. Like, dude, it's legit. Yeah, I'll be there next week for sure. D definitely check they're, it they're, out. Coming from growing up in Houston, there's endless amounts of insane food. Houston and, is uh, such a great food city, yeah, right? It does it not really get the is, love yeah. it, it deserves. It, it's it's hard. I mean, Austin has good food too, but it's like it's hard to compare. It really is. The ethnic yeah. food in Houston is so legit, and the, the ethnic legit. communities right. are so large that yep. you can get some really good stuff, man. Really good. I, I couldn't agree with that more, man. A hundred percent. I would totally agree with that. Same, same. I would say for the Dallas Fort Worth area. Sure. The the great the, Korean just, Korean food in Dallas is unreal. Oh, the Las Colinas area. That's yeah. where you want to go if mm -hmm. you want to get even Vietnamese or North sure. Vietnamese. They even break it down into different types of Vietnam food here. Like it's then people don't know Texas has know. like some of the best food you could ever want from any culture, especially yeah. in Houston. Yeah, you think time. of a you think of a culture, you're going to go find it and probably three or four places, Agreed. which I love. You know, Agreed. that's awesome. Um, well, that's great. OK, so sounds like you're a foodie. Sounds like about to get into this. Mm -hmm. I love this. OK, <clears throat> let's see. Let's see how uh, your Spanish knowledge is. Ooh. Oh, OK. Boy. <laughs> All right. What, do, what does Dorito actually mean? I don't know. Dorito. You've eaten them a lot. Have I? I don't know. Okay. Have you eaten a Dorito? Oh, a Dorito chips? chips? Yeah. I mean, I've yeah. eaten tons of Doritos. Yeah. Uh, some, something small, something. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's it's uh, Dorito is Spanish for little golden things. Little golden things. Okay, cool. So yeah. I got the small or little part. Yeah, of it. you did. Well, because <laughs> the ether, right? The ether. Right, that's right, what made right. me. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. that's good. That's good. You picked yeah. up on that. So, um, that that's good. It, you know, you've ever, you've heard of Dorado, right? The city of sure. El Dorado. That, yeah. That's all that means, right? Dorito. Ah. Uh, which which actually, and in, in if you're Mexico and stuff, like I'm, uh, my mom's from Mexico. Like cool. We, no, nobody's saying little Doritos. Like that's not right. that's not a term <laughs> anybody's using. So, <laughs> right. I'm sure that's why. <laughs> I'm sure that's why they took it. Um, okay, what was the first food eaten in space? Um, I can't remember. I want to say it was like some type of beef stew or something, but I can't remember, man. I, I don't. I remember hearing what it is, but I don't know. I do not know. I'm failing in this trivia badly. Yeah, yeah, no, you're not. These are hard. That's a that's a hard question. Uh, the answer is applesauce. Oh, okay. So I was way off. Not even remotely close. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I think beef stew would have been, they would have appreciated that much better. You're probably <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. What, what is canola an abbreviation for? So you've heard canola? like canola oil. Yeah. Right? Like what does canola mean? What's an abbreviation for? I do not know. Canola. You're, you're going to learn. I'm about to learn. Let me have it. What do we got? Canadian oil. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I had no no clue. No clue. There you go. Now that's a little a little a fun Canadian fact you got. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> no, I, I honestly didn't know that either. Um, okay. What turns a plain martini into a dirty martini? Olive juice. Bam. Come on. Yeah, I got that part. You got that one. You got that one. Sailors used to sur suffer from a horrible illness called scurvy. What causes scurvy? Not eating any fruits or vegetables and eating only meat, I think. You know what? We're going to take that answer. That's pretty much right. <laughs> Honestly, that's right. It's basically a lack of vitamin C. So like you okay, said, if you're not cool. eating the yeah. fruits and vegetables, right, you're not getting that. So yeah, that's it. Uh, which is the only food that can never go off or go bad? We've had this on the podcast before. So if you're listening... You should know this answer. If not, good God. That can never, ever go bad. It's only, yeah. There's only one food in the entire mm. world that can never go bad. 
It's only one. And you know it. This is something you use, you have used numerous times. Uh, butter? No. no. Honey. Okay. Honey. honey. Okay, cool. Yeah, that honey. makes sense. That honey makes is sense. the only thing that, that will never go back. They even found honey in Egyptian tombs and were able to eat it. Really? After wow. thousands of years. Yeah, never. If you preserve it, it's a preservative. Right. Okay, cool. It, it never goes bad. It's literally a preservative in and of itself. Um, and it's yeah. the only it's the only food item on the planet that's like that. Wow. I, I, I think that's pretty cool. Little honeys, little little bees, man. They're they're amazing. <laughs> um, baked beans are made from what type of bean? Uh, I think they're pinto beans. I don't know. I, I don't I like beans very much. This. Yeah, I, I'm not really. Well, I do like beans. I'm Mexican. Uh -huh. I love re, I love refried beans. That's a huge <laughs> part of our our diet. Um, it's uh, Herico beans. Oh, yeah. I, no, I, I, I didn't know that either. No idea. Yeah. I, I, I did. OK, uh, let's see here. OK, we got two more. Then OK. All right. Second to last one. What item of food holds the world record for being the most stolen item of food in the world? The most stolen item of food. <laughs> yeah. For some That's reason, interesting. They uh, steal this this food the most. Who steals this food? Okay, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm gonna make a guess and just say rice because it comes in bags or something. I don't know. That, that's actually not a bad guess at all, dude, to be to be frank with you. That's okay. a very smart guess. Um, it's not right, but it's a good guess. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's thought out. Like, I like that. Uh, it's cheese. I okay, didn't know this. Cheese. Okay, cool. The most stolen food in the world. People are just stealing, stealing cheese. Stealing cheese all over the just, world, the, huh? <laughs> There's just cheese uh, operations going around. They're just, a, you know. There's a huge cheese theft ring, worldwide <laughs> <Yeah>. cheese theft <laughs> ring. <laughs> the, they got the Gorgonzola gang. They got the Brie gang. Very good. They're just, yeah. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Last question. I think you got this. Oh, you know what? This oh, don't is make actually... assumptions. <laughs> this, is, this is tough, but I, I feel fair to end on. What okay. type of food is a peanut? Okay. I, I feel like I've heard this question before. It's I a trick question a, for sure. I want to say it's a legume. Boom. All right. Thank you. And it's strong. It's to get embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> no, dog, I, listen, I threw some tough ones at you. I'm not, you know, come on. I, I just hit you with this out of nowhere. You have time to prepare. You did great. That's man. okay. That's all good. Great. I don't mind. Great. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Uh, look, you did great. Like I said, you did great. Uh, Tony, this has been awesome, man. I, I really do um, uh, appreciate everything here. Um, you know, appreciate you opening up and just um, coming on the podcast and talking about your new stuff coming on. I, you know, so looking forward to all this coming out and for the world to be able to, uh, you know, hear it and listen and be a part of this podcast too. I'm actually going to jump in and listen on that, man. And thanks, uh, man. Check that out um, as well. Thank so I, I love that. Um, you know what I want to do real quick before we go? Sure. Just shout, shout out any places you like to eat around you that you like around to go me eat here. At. Let's yeah, let's give some love to some local food places here. Oh man, we were talking about <laughs> this is so funny. I'm going to say this. We were talking about Chinese buffet, and there's a Chinese buffet here called Buffet Palace that I'll go and 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 go to here and there. That I I go whenever I uh, feeling feeling like i want to just fatten up a little bit yeah <laughs> all right i love it buffet palace <laughs> Damn. is that but if, in you, if you want to know you know it's in it's in south austin uh but if you want to know like some something real like something here in town that i i like a lot uh there's actually a really good lebanese food trailer just around the corner uh from us here in dripping springs called um i'm 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 having a brain fart on the name actually, uh, but it's, I'm going to look it up because I want to. Yeah. I want to hear, I want to promote it. It's, it's called Layla's kitchen, L E Y L A S kitchen. It's a food truck right off Hamilton pool road. It's just around the corner from my house. And they're, they're a really nice Lebanese family. And it's really, really good food. Look at that. Look at us shouting out the Lebanese food trucks today on the show. I'm talking it. about man. And I'll, awesome. I'll hit up Beirut for sure. For sure. Oh, you'll 100%. love it, dude. Yeah. Say hi to Charlie. Tell him I sent you. Tell him Patrick. Say he'll know. Dude, he, I, right, I was I next to 
I was next to Charlie in a food truck for over two years. We, we, we Excellent. Hung I out, definitely. We hung out every yeah. day, you know, all day. Um, it's amazing food. You'll love it. Um, okay, dude. Well, look, um, again, we'll put all the uh, links and everything in the description. Uh, if you just want to tell people, lastly, I guess, how to stay connected with you online. Yeah. So uh, my last name is spelled with a K, K-A-M-E-L. Tony Camel Music is my handle for everything, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Patreon, Facebook, everything, Tony Camel music. And, uh, you can just find, I mean, just Google it and then you'll know where to find me. You want to hear the music. It's on all the outlets. Uh, you can order a vinyl. If you're a vinyl person, the vinyl sounds really good. So oh hell yeah, uh, that's about it, man. That's awesome. Uh, especially the way you recorded it to then have yeah. it on vinyl for, Oh, come on. That's awesome. What we a great worked touch. hard on that. What a great touch, man. Uh, well, listen again, uh, Tony. I really, really appreciate it, man. My, my best of luck to you and your your family. Uh, this new addition to the family as well, man. I wish you the best. Um, Thanks, Patrick. Coming up, so I appreciate it, man. It's great to talk to you. Yeah, you as well, brother. We'll send out an email when the episode and everything goes up, so you can have all that information. Okay, so um, sounds great. Thank you again, man. Hope you have a good rest of the weekend, and we'll we'll talk soon. All right, take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks, brother. Bye bye. And now it's time for my favorite part of the show, the end credits. This is everyone responsible for making the show happen. Executive producer, Sebastian Sauerborn. Podcast manager, Nevena Ponovich. Marketing manager, Caroline Grape. Video and audio editors, Danilo Vojnov and Pavel Sebastianovic. Thumbnail designer, Marco Vukovic. Social media manager, Ursa Rusman. Guest outreach, Corey Mencies, Designing Image Quotes, Jay Apuya, Social Media Videos, Labri Fernandez, Outreach Support, Yonette Del Mundo. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. The Lone Star Play Podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. <laughs>